I thought we could start with a very easy round of questions just to give everyone a, a couple of sentences to quickly introduce themselves and their background. Okay, so my name is Humano Ali. I'm a professor of applied mathematics at Caltech, and um, my interest in probabilistic numerics come from the perspective of decision theory and game theory, and the idea is to develop um, fast solvers or operator-adapted wavelets uh, using this approach. Thank you. Um, I'm Oksana Skripti. I'm an assistant professor at The Ohio State University in the United States. Um, my interest is in probabilistic numerical methods for ODEs. Um, and um, um, we, we have had some really interesting talks in this workshop on these topics. I look forward to discussing um, some of these methods with you further. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Osborne, um, engineering science in Oxford. Particular interests are in Bayesian optimization and Bayesian quadrature, particularly as it might afford automatic machine learning. Uh, my name is Philippe Haig. I'm uh, in Tübingen. And like Mike, I am um, interested in particularly in applications and uses of uncertainty in computation. And I've also been involved with this round of people since, I don't know, 2012 or so. Uh, my name is Yusuf Marzouk. Uh, I'm the faculty at MIT. And I think my broad interests are in uncertainty quantification, um, which motivates interest in probabilistic numerics. Um, the sort of maybe key areas of interest are inverse problems and how you know discretization error and things like that affects the solution of inverse problems, but also Bayesian computation <coughs> and some of the Bayesian computational issues that arise in PN, uh, I think are very interesting. So. And just to complete the, the loop, I'm Tim Sullivan. I'm one of the co-chairs of this session and one of the co-organizers of this workshop. I'm a junior professor in applied mathematics in uh, the Free University of Berlin and the Zuse Institute Berlin. And like uh, Yusuf, I have uh, broad interests in uncertainty quantification uh, generally, and that's what's brought me into probabilistic numerics. Chris, maybe. Oh, Chris doesn't want to reintroduce himself. <laughs> So the questions that we have coming up um, are, of course, not intended to be exclusive. And the panel discussion, the selection of panelists, is not is also not intended to be exclusive. So if people in the audience have uh, burning questions or strong opinions, uh, I think you know this is exactly the function that Chris serves with his roving microphone to enable you to express yourselves uh, on the record there. So a uh, first sort of leading question um, is, do we feel like perhaps we've exhausted the problem classes for probabilistic numerics? Um, we very quickly write down, OK, optimization, quadrature, differential equations, linear algebra. Um, what do the panelists think? Is this a sort of complete classification, or are there still um, uh, veins of minerals to be tapped in terms of problem classes? I was quick to just grab a microphone before. before. I, I know that everyone's going to say the same thing now, so I'm, I just thought I'm going to be the first one to say. I think what's missing is the connection between all of them, right? Con communication between these individual uh, steps. And um, this is actually a really interesting point to bring up because I think we've been talking about propagation of uncertainty between individual compartmentalized steps ever since we started talking about this. Uh, but so far, there's actually very little work on this. So maybe if, if you want to say something in this direction as well. Right? But uh, that's definitely, for me, the, the most pressing uh, question on this sort of, along this vertical. Yeah, I, mean, I think um, just thinking, for instance, one example is in the context of inverse problems. If you'd like to assess error due to, you know, solving an inverse problem involves solving a forward model, which might involve linear algebra, the solution of differential equations, maybe some quadrature, some kind of integral differential equation. So I think in that sense, you know, at a high level, if you're trying to represent uncertainty in the solution to the inverse problem, one would want to make connections among all these things because I think they're all at play. Um, how to do that, you know, will take some, not immediately obvious to me, but. Um, I, I was minded of the phenomenon whereby a paper that has a question mark in the title Almost always the answer is no. Like, you know, <laughs> do video games cause, you know, additional truancy in school children? No, actually, after you examine the evidence. And I think that's true here as well. So in my talk um, the other day, I was trying to say that actually, at least within machine learning, all the re really interesting applications are exotic. That is, there's some combination of 
these multiple methods that are traditionally called numerics. And that's exactly where, as the previous uh, panelists have mentioned, we should be going. So I agree with the, the points that have been brought up here. I did notice a pattern in, in many of the really interesting research talks that were described uh, in this workshop, um, that there's not one specific numerical problem being addressed, but sometimes even in trying to define a prior for probabilistic numerical methods, like in your talk, for example, you still needed to do some integration that may not have a closed form um, um, solution that we, uh, so I think, in those settings, we have to figure out a way to uh, try to apply probabilistic numerics to all these things or some of these things and figure out which of them um, um, or, or where our emphasis should be and whether or not we can do them all simultaneously in a self-consistent <coughs> framework. Well, um one remarkable thing about peer in it that it, that it um, alleviates the process of uh, trial and error or guesswork when you try to develop a new numerical method, right? If I, if I ask you to solve a linear system, if I were to do that like 20 years ago, you will spend two years figuring out what to do. But if you take this PN approach, um, you can come up to with a solution in a very simple manner, right? Now, um, this process of trial and error and guesswork is still very much present in machine learning, right? Where people try basically new tricks and new tweaks to develop new algorithms. I think this is a really new frontier if, if we can do something there. I, I see, um, I see uh, what is being done in deep learning I think you can see it as glorified numerical approximation. Uh, but it's a very hard numerical approximation problem because you are dealing with high dimensional spaces and you are dealing with subspaces of functions on these high dimensional spaces that are hard to categorize. And the kind of constraints that you have in your input output functions are highly nonlinear. But if you could do something there, that would be wonderful. On that theme, I'd like to throw that back to Philip and to Mike as our somehow resident machine learners because I know that you've made comments in the direction of one thing that PN could deliver is an automization or automatization of what would otherwise be ad hoc parameters like choices of step size and so on. So I throw that back to you for, for a comment or, or rebuttal. Yeah, so I, I think I can just maybe stress again what I tried to say in my opening talk, that um, um, as Mike also then uh, repeated in his talk, machine learning is a really ideal application area for probabilistic numerics because it's super exciting and hot at the moment. Uh, there's a huge amount of interest in industry and even in academia in this area, and it, it poses very specific computational challenges that are not well served by existing numerical algorithms. So it's a real killer app. And th th these, these challenges are specifically to do with uncertainty and also with the propagation of uncertainty actually through computations. So typical contemporary data science solutions don't consist of one single problem. They consist of a whole chain of different steps, um, each of which contributes to the overall error and each of which is subject to uh, often quite tight computational constraints which are difficult to manage. So this is all, these are all areas where we can really contribute. And actually, all of these areas of computation also feature in machine learning. So optimization features in the fitting of statistical estimators, like deep nets, quadrature uh, features in all Bayesian inference, essentially, if you take quadrature to mean integration. Uh, differential equations are beginning to feature more and more, both in the area called forecasting and in uh, the analytical description of the behavior of optimization algorithms, and linear algebra is just everywhere. So it really is every single area that you might be working on in, in, in PN is directly represented in machine learning, so you shouldn't feel left out. The same could, the same could also be said, though, of uncertainty quantification for complex systems, and I, th I think uh, a comment either from Human or from Yusuf with their experience with uh, uncertainty quantification through uh, the national labs in the US, perhaps you have a, a comment? Uh, 
Yeah, I, th I think certainly that's true. I mean, in inverse problems and uncertain quantification very broadly, um, one one target one could imagine, and I say this kind of without any um, you know real basis for saying so, that um, in the national labs in the U.S. since we brought that up, there's been enormous investments in solvers, um, linear algebra tools, at very at the very large scale. Um, preconditioners, I mean, these things, Trilinos, Petsy, these libraries that people use um, in, in all over the place. And I think that at the same time in the national labs, there's been a lot of investment in uncertainty quantification, and to some extent that's one of the origins of uncertainty quantification research in the US. Um, but I think those two sides haven't necessarily met um, at the level of probabilistic numerics. I think people talk about what solver challenges arise, what deterministic solver challenges arise in the solution of uncertainty quantification problems, but haven't, say, looked at what if these solvers, what if you consider them in a probabilistic, through a probabilistic lens, and what implications would that have? Um, I think, you know, that audience might be more conservative given everything they've invested in this over decades, but down the line, I could envision that being. Um... Yes, Mike. Um, so I completely agree, actually, that you know that's another rich area for potential application of probabilistic numeric methods, but it does present a challenge because if we're, you know, one part of this community is applying itself to machine learning and the other is to UQ or whatever else, we don't have that cohesive identity, right? We'll end up going to different conferences. We'll end up developing slightly different um, variants of a similar type of methods. And, you know, as Philip was saying, the, the needs of machine learning in particular are quite exotic. They're, they're not simply um, requiring the same sort of modular numeric algorithms that have previously been developed. So I'm, I'm not sure how we kind of solve that. Um, it, I think it will be a problem if we do want to continue to cohere as a community. So in fact, one of the later uh, topics for discussion is going to be the, the community. But um, to move on to something else first, um, Chris's formulation of this question was to talk about sort of hard versus soft PN, thinking, uh, meaning, is probabilistic numerics merely a means to an end, um, or is it a scientific goal in itself? Um, or a related question, which was the way that, uh, as we were preparing these slides, I formulated is, where is the P in PN? So are we uh, deriving deterministic algorithms um, for deterministic challenges, but these algorithms are derived based on some probabilistic perspective or reasoning? Or are we talking in about intrinsically randomized algorithms? I, I have opinions on, <laughs> on both of these questions. I mean, so the first question, I mean, the answer is sort of obvious, and we don't need to have consistent answers across the room. I think it's OK for some of us to be motivated by applications and others by the science of it. Speaking for me personally, I got interested in probabilistic numerics because I wanted to do Gaussian processes, basically. And I discovered in the first year of my PhD that actually I couldn't do Gaussian processes unless I was able to efficiently marginalize the high parameters. And it seemed like none of the existing methods for doing so were all that good. Hence, interest in Bayesian quadrature and ultimately Bayesian optimization. But to the second question, I mean, I think we should be very clear within this community that stochastic numerics is not probabilistic numerics. The two things can overlap, but they're not the same thing. And, you know, I think that's been part of the problem we've had traditionally in trying to convey what it is that we're doing in probabilistic numerics, according to our definition, at least. Um, I have my own views on whether or not stochastic numerics makes any sense. To me, computation is ultimately about making decisions. That is, we want to allocate a particular bit of compute. And if we're making a decision, to my mind at least, that should be made according to an expected loss function, which has a minimum. There's a single number. If you're randomizing, it means that essentially you're ambivalent between you know, all possible answers, which means you're not solving a decision problem. So uh, yeah, people can feel free to disagree with that. I, I have a sense that when it comes to the decision theoretic uh, thing, Human probably wants to speak uh, first, but Yusuf next. Well, I, I think that uh, both fields would benefit in interacting, right? Uh, randomized linear algebra and PN. Now, from the perspective of decision theory, you're right. If your loss is, is convex in what you had, your decision is based on, then uh, the answer is going to be a pure strategy. There is no randomness. But uh, if your loss is non-convex, then randomized strategies are going to be optimal, right? And non-convexity could appear in the choice of 
the collocation points, the quadrature points, right? If you look at the error of the numerical method, it is non-convex in those things, right? So maybe this is telling us that perhaps we should randomize those measurements. Yeah, I mean, so a related comment, I guess, um, when you talk about stochastic numerics, I mean, so the first thing I think of is like random is a sort of randomized numerical linear algebra. And I think, you know, I think there, to some extent, the, the culture is quite different in that you essentially want to treat those answers as deterministic. You want to say they hold with very, very high probability, and then you essentially, practically speaking, treat it as deterministic and move on. I mean, and, and, and I think that is different in character than, than things we're talking about in PN. Um, but the other, I guess, question I have is, 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 and this is perhaps a question from the outside, but I think this is a question many people would have, not sort of um, where is the P in PN, but how to interpret the P in PN. And I think this gets to, I mean, a lot of the presentations we saw this week, you know, are, is your probabilistic numerical method Bayesian or not? Um, what exactly, you know, where does the probabilistic modeling enter? Are you constructing priors? Are you modeling discretization error directly? All these kinds of things. And I think these all give rise to distributions. And having a distribution on an answer <laughs> is not the same as having an interpretation of the distribution. And I think maybe one of the things, and I think people here have many interpretations of these distributions, but I think something that for people maybe outside of the core of the community to understand is what are the interpretations of these things? You know, how far can we take those interpretations? Um, in my mind, I think that's one of the very interesting questions that um, I personally would like to learn more about, and I wonder what people, what answers people have to that kind of question. Can I briefly come back to this uh, community question? Because I think it is actually important in this particular context. Um, so maybe a first thing to say is that, I, I, um, as Mike said, it's it's very important that we allow ourselves these differing opinions within this room and uh, allow ourselves to, to, to discuss these openly, just as we do now, maybe. Um, and I, I don't just sort of say this as sort of a, a big uh, sort of, I don't know, sociological point. I actually think that over the past few years that we've had these meetings, all of our own opinions on the answers to these questions have really evolved, right? So those of us who came from a very applied perspective had maybe to, had to learn, or I personally definitely had to learn that there was a whole rich area of, of, of knowledge in applied mathematics that I only very slowly got to understand better. And at the same time, also some of, the, some of you who maybe came from a more theoretical background had maybe realized that if you actually want to do something in practice, sometimes you have to allow yourself a little bit of leeway and uh, break the philosophical boundaries a little bit. And th that conversation is, for me, one of the greatest values of these meetings and this community. And it's really exciting, uh, sort of almost serendipitous, that we've managed to get this very different uh, sort of uh, heterogeneous crowd of people together. It's, I think, it's almost, yeah, it's like a, a stroke of luck that we all ended up together because we would usually not interact with each other, right? And um, that is a real opportunity for this community. It's also a challenge, but it's also a real opportunity. And I can, again, <laughs> to toot that horn again, uh, speaking from the perspective of the machine learning community, that this really an area that has managed to be successful by striking at just the right balance between allowing people to do something crazy now and then, and just try out some weird idea and see if it does something that works, like deep learning, that, which no one understands, right? But, which is surprisingly effective but also forcing people to sometimes take a step back and try to find a theoretical understanding, not just do something crazy all the time, but sometimes. And that if we manage to do that in our community, that's gonna keep us productive. Now, of course, I agree with Yusef that when we speak to the outside world, we should be a little bit coherent. So there should be a bit of a title above this whole thing that explains what we're doing, and that doesn't make it look like it's just an umbrella for everyone who doesn't fit everywhere else. So for, for, from the outside perspective, I would propose a relatively vague description that is not so specific, that is more sort of, you know, algorithms that use probability distributions to reason with uncertainty. That might include stochastic algorithms, deterministic algorithms. For me personally, it's whenever you use a probability distribution to think about a, the result of a computation, maybe that's a bit too broad. Excellent. Thank you. <coughs> I just wanted to make a point um, that follows up from Yusef's earlier point about the inverse problem and how randomization, whether it's 
considered probabilistic in some sense, like Bayesian sense, uh, or if it's based on randomization, um, whether or not, um, why, first of all, why it is often tempting, I think, to, to use this in the context of the inverse problem. I think a lot of the models that we work with um, tend to be very, um, very specific, um, uh, very sort of um, nonlinear, and, and perhaps have some or, or quite a bit of potentially model error. Um, so the belief that you know the model we're working with, the forward problem, is actually the correct interpretation of what's actually happening, uh, can sometimes lead to um, well some substantial bias um, when when we talk about inference. And so a lot of times, like adding a little bit of noise, whether or not it's um, it has kind of a, a probabilistic <coughs> interpretation or not, can be um, can, can result in some um, some some benefits in doing inference. The problem is that <coughs> we have to specify where that noise, where that randomness comes from. And so in my opinion, there are a number of different sources of this error. One of them would be model error. And I wonder if um, probabilistic numerics, if, if how you consider uh, uh, probabilistic numerics uh, or probabilistic numerical error as being a type of model error or as being something in addition to model error, um, is, it, is it to do with of the tools that we use to try to get at that model, which may be specified implicitly, or is it a part of our not understanding how the world really works? Um, and I think we sort of have to either connect those two or we have to differentiate between them and, and sort of set out um, how we treat uh, model error um, before we really um, kind of very deeply talk about maybe numerical error. So. I guess you could interpret those errors in the in the sense of uh, repeated minimax games, and th this probabilistic inter interpretation is actually very interesting from the perspective of UQ, where people have also model errors, where they have a Bayesian description of their model, and then you have a very natural coupling between the numerical error and the Bayesian error, right? Now the, the Bayesian. Um, Errors can be interpreted in two manners, right? It could be a representation of your subjective belief, or it could be a representation of the error that you will make in an underlying game with respect to the loss. The difference between the two is that if you're a Bayesian, your prior is a representation of your belief, and if you take the perspective of, the, of decision theory, the prior is a representation of an optimal mix strategy for the specific loss that you have, right? You change your loss, you have to change your prior. If you're a Bayesian, you change the loss. So we, my, my belief is still there. Yusuf, very quickly. Oh, okay, so I, I think my screensaver kicking in is an indication we should try another question. Or do you have a quick comment, Mike? At least one. Um, many other things. <laughs> I, I'd, I'd like to discuss. I'll hold you to one, Mike. <laughs> okay. Well. Let me just respond to what Philip said briefly about treating machine learning as kind of a, um, an example, an inspiration for what we could do with this community. And I think that's right, but what I don't think we've done in this community but was done in machine learning was the identification of a common set of problems that we're all kind of working towards. So what machine learning did really well, I think, was saying, well, classification, that's a thing. It's got a range of different applications. We'll abstract away from those applications and say, you know, you've got a training set and test it, whatever. And Pretty much everyone, theorists and um, you know, applications focused people alike, could agree that that was the thing we were trying to solve and they would bring their particular different toolkits to the solution of that problem. Um, I, I don't feel that we've necessarily got to that point in this community and part of the problem is that the needs we're trying to serve are quite diverse. You know? So if we're trying to work on machine learning, numerics problems, they're not the same as the kind of numerics problems necessarily that you want to resolve. So somehow within this community we, we do need to agree on those. Um, yeah, I, Mike, I agree, agree entirely. Um, and I wonder if, like, maybe we could rephrase, I, you know, so on, on the one hand, okay, we'd like to have a description of the field and sort of be broad enough to include, you know, everything that people do and everything people consider important. But maybe, maybe rather than maybe it's rather than that, and maybe even rather than having a specific problem, maybe we could phrase it as a specific goal of the community. And if and if there's a specific goal, you know, then you know, 
probabilistically represent discretization error. I mean, I realize that's too narrow, and, and but that's that's maybe my parochial view. Um, but some specific goal like that might lend some coherence without then being overly prescriptive about some of the things that it, we're still debating about. Um. I think those are all good points, and, and many of them are going to link into later of the questions. So let's move on and see what we, what we get. So one um, topic that's already been discussed by many talks in this workshop and has been touched on by the panelists uh, is Bayesianity. Is being Bayesian worth it? And if PN isn't trying to be Bayesian, then what does it mean without at least this particular principled foundation? That's not to say that there aren't other principled foundations. But something that being Bayesian certainly offers is it offers a benchmark. So more generally, what um, kinds of protocols and benchmarks could we imagine for um, chaining together probabilistic numerical methods, comparing probabilistic numerical methods that are attempting the same task, uh, comparing them with each other, comparing them with standard methods. So I think Mike is champing at the bit. Yeah, well, actually, what I'm going to say might surprise those who know me, because actually, I'm, I'm not sure that probabilistic numerics is or should be Bayesian. Well, uh, <laughs> um, and the reason for that is, you know, it doesn't satisfy Herman's uh, definition of what being Bayesian means because we can't separate the loss from the prior. In order to deliver a numerical algorithm, it needs to run efficiently, right? It can't just be the most sophisticated, most um, accurate model that we can devise for whatever this problem is. It needs to be one that's somehow constrained by our requirement that it run in the innards of some other system. So in that sense, we have to have the loss function downstream informing our selection of prior, which to me kind of sacrifices the, the basic thing. And on the other end, there's a corresponding problem that the notion of a prior is really hard to uh, sustain and explain in the numerical setting, right? Because in contrast to, uh, so for those of you who haven't heard this argument yet, in classic statistics, the prior is necessary because you just have to say what you, were, what you believe because there's fundamentally data coming in from the outside world that you sort of have to agree on a certain set of assumptions. In numerics, there's this weird situation that we have a string in a formal language that describes the problem perfectly. So we know everything, but we also don't know everything because we can't actually do the computation just from the string on its own. So there's, there's a real problem that we, we know a lot more about the problem than in uh, classic physical statistics. And so maybe the question is actually, so, I, so first of all, I should say, I actually like your work on Bayesian public numerical methods. So I think it's a really, it's important to set as a philosophical goal to say, given a prior, this is what ideally the algorithm should be doing. And then we can think about in which sense it can't be doing this in a realistic way and what, what boundaries, bounded rationality puts on that. But there's a, as a question be before that, that we also have to discuss what the prior should be. And then once we have the prior, we can then try to be Bayesian relative to that prior. But even just knowing what the prior is is a really big philosophical point that is totally unaddressed <coughs> so far. Well, so just a very small point, and this may be more a question for, for people who have thought about this more than me, is do subjective priors have any role to play in probabilistic numerics? Or are they not, is that a not a valid way of choosing a prior? You will get fried by a numerical analyst for, for doing that. <laughs> so uh, I, I think if you want to make an impact in numerical analysis, you have to use their tools to um, benchmark the methods that you are developing. So their tools are what? Accuracy versus complexity. If not, they will just not listen to you. And I think it would be also interesting to take these tools of PN and try to make an impact in classification, and there you have clearly defined benchmarks, right? MNIST, CIFAR. Mm. You can look at uh, MNIST as a numerical uh, regression problem, right? You can use ga a Gaussian process. And if you do Gaussian process on MNIST, you get about 99.6% accuracy, which is <coughs> surprisingly high, right? So, and this is non-optimized, you have not even tried. This is just using a Gaussian kernel. Can you do better using some techniques from um, numerical approximation and thinking in uh, uh, processing those techniques with a probabilistic mind, I don't know. But uh, I think that would be really interesting to do that. If, if, we, if we compare, if we develop our own benchmarks, then we take the risk of turning the community into a closed community. People will not pay attention. So. Hi, yes. Um, I just had um, 
an additional point to make about the prior selection, prior choice. Um, I, I think that uh, in terms of the types of priors that we use in probabilistic numerical analysis, uh, there's not uh, very much choice uh, in terms of the, the types of uh, prior models that, that we have um, that at least have like a nice closed form representation. So obviously a lot of us work with Gaussian process priors and uh, you can do some really fancy <coughs> things uh, by looking at the covariance structure. However, sometimes those fancy things actually involve things like really complicated integrals and things that you know we may not be able to, to solve. So I feel like there should be more work maybe um, in, in the direction of, of um, sort of setting out, or, or at least um, setting out like classes of priors, maybe they can be used in different situations, different contexts. I know that um, in your work there, there was a, um, ideas uh, on, on in that regard that were proposed as well. I think we should be doing a lot more work in terms of prior selection, and that would actually, so, so if in our community we develop um, a class of priors that might be very helpful for some of our problems. These might actually be very relevant, indeed I think they will, to um, spatial statistics. And so if we can sort of export some of our ideas to those other fields, it might make us more, kind of more relevant to them as well. Yeah, so, so this is kind of a, a speculative question, I think, both for Oksana and, 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 and Human. Um, so I agree entirely that, you know, subjective priors just I think won't fly with a with numerical analyst. Um, but uh, you know, other schools of thought in the Bayesian statistics world for constructing priors, reference priors, objective priors, things like that, do they have a role to play in PM? For classification and inverse problems, definitely. Definitely, because we don't know how to construct priors there, right? I mean, you don't have a clear way of coming up with the prior or just 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 take like mnist i mean mnist is a very simple problem uh specifying a prior or just remain gaussian okay so gaussian prior you just have to choose your kernel for mnist which one do you pick mm -hmm. that's a very simple problem we, we don't know how to answer that mm -hmm. right so what people do is that they take a gaussian prior with some width with one di uh, one dimensional parameter that they fit and that's it can we go beyond that? <coughs> I don't know. So um, I'm wondering, beca because you're, you, you're bringing up uh, MNIST, um, there, there might actually be a sort of a corresponding problem w in the overlap between computer science on the one hand and applied mathematics, and particularly the UQ community in applied mathematics and machine learning in computer science, that there's a corresponding problem that, that these two communities don't always try to solve separate problems. Right? They're not the same, but they're also not entirely distinct. And so from the perspective of I now self-identify as a computer scientist, um, even though I didn't study this at all, um, uh, I would say that predicting labels on MNIST, that's machine learning. That's not probabilistic numerics. So um, that whenever your prior, maybe actually the prior is a way of quantifying the difference between those two fields. That when you, when, you, when you should really know what your prior is, it's probably a numerical problem. And if you don't really know what your prior is because there's, it involves data that comes from the outside world that can't be probed to perfect fidelity, then it's statistics and learning and whatever, right? So statistics is also a, sort of another point in this uh, map, right? And, and I think we also have to be careful not to grab too much land from other communities because otherwise, uh, the statisticians will come back, or the machine learners, or whoever, right, and say, well, you're just reinventing our own field. We had the problem with probabilistic programming for a while, that people in this community, in that community felt like we had just reinvented a name for their field, which is not true, but that's whatever. I also have personally, I have experiences uh, having to defend our field in front of uh, um, funding bodies, right, panels, uh, selection panels for, for grants, very specifically asking, you know, about stochastic numerics, about machine learning, about uncertainty quantifications, and isn't it all the same thing? So we should also be a bit careful to separate what we do from these fields. Overlap is good because if we're a close community, people will forget about us. But we should also be careful not to grab everything from them. 
actually, I would love to see numerical analyst uh, grabbing MNIST <laughs> and you seeing it as, as a purely numerical approximation problem. Because I, I think that they're, they're, they have a lot of contributions to make. And from a theoretical standpoint, it's a very interesting problem, right? Again, you just, it's a, if you look at it as a numerical analyst, basically what you are doing, assume you're just trying to separate four from fives. You are trying to construct a function that is equal to minus one on fours, one on fives, and whenever you are shown a new picture, you decide that it's a five or a four, depending if, uh, depending on the value of your function above or less than zero, right? You again, you just do that with uh, I don't know cardinal spline, polyharmonic splines. You already get a very high accuracy, and this is this is without putting much thought into it. Now, why are these methods not used? Well, they don't scale. Right, the complexity is at least n square. In worst case, n cube. They don't scale well. I think the the problem that people have solved in machine learning, especially with deep learning, is that they got something that works and that scales. And if you look back a little bit into into history, I mean, th there was a uh, um, Abraham Wald when he developed decision theory. Developed it at a time where people didn't have computers, so he didn't care about about computational complexity. And to some degree, I think machine learning is rediscovering uh, this adversarial approach. But they have one thing that Walt didn't have in his formulation. They have the notion of complexity in mind, and I think this is crucial. This is where, I mean, the, 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 uh, the, this convolution neural net, uh, for instance, are, are beating, beating support vector machines. OK, I'm getting in trouble. Uh, so just to be clear, that don't, people don't misunderstand me. Of course, if you're a numerical analyst and you want to work on MNIST, you're very much invited to do so. Right? <laughs> Just when you do it, send it to NIPS because you'll get real feedback on, <laughs> from on, on how good your method actually is. So uh, I think this is a good, a good point to, to pass on to um, the, this discussion on the, the culture of probabilistic numerics. Um, how can uh, and, and possibly should um, uh, we go forward uh, in terms of gatherings, in terms of where we publish, those of us particularly still in um, more rooted in academic culture rather than industrial and application culture, uh, you know, we have to, to publish uh, rather than uh, necessarily uh, secure uh, killer apps in, in the wild. Um, but on the other hand, there's a, a part of the community that definitely needs the killer apps in the wild and the, the publications are not so important. Um, outreach for our community, how we express ourselves, and perhaps a provocative one uh, in terms of jobs. Should we be saying there should be professorships in PN in our various institutions? Well, I want to start out by just, uh, I guess, pushing back a little bit against this idea that we should be careful not to uh, annoy numerical analysts. I'm quite sanguine about annoying <laughs> numerical analysts. <laughs> I mean, I. <coughs> So I, you know, I don't think the tools that they have, I don't think the problems that they're interested in solving are the same as the problems that I'm interested in solving. And I don't think that necessarily defining our own problems to solve makes us a closed community. So long as those goals are motivated by another community that feels that you know, they will actually meet their needs. So that's why I think machine learning is, we're kind of trying to say is, is really important for us because there are real numerical-ish problems there that are not the same as those that can be solved by the traditional numerical analysis community. Um, if we can identify you know, a small number of those that everyone in the room can agree we should be trying to solve, that gives us a kind of flag in the ground around which we can uh, combine, our, you know, combine our efforts. That seems to me to be the way forwards. Okay. So Mike said something about applications. I totally agree. Um, I, personally, I'll try and establish training deep networks as a real application for PN because it has all the right aspects in terms of prior and likelihood and so on. Um, I, think I find gatherings a really interesting question because Mike partly brought it up as well in his talk. Um, so at the moment, we're sort of split between two main conferences, NIPS and SIM UQ. And we have uh, mini symposia coming up next week at SIM UQ, which you two are also organizing. Um, and we've had workshops at NIPS in the past. We also have papers at NIPS every now and then. I wonder whether, so Mike brought up the idea of having a regular workshop at NIPS. 
I think this is actually a really good idea, and maybe the two of us should just get together and do it. Um, uh, together with everyone else, of course. So we will, we will put out the, the we'll, you know, we'll try it. If it gets accepted, we'll put it out. And then I very much hope that many of you will send in a submission, because if you don't get enough submission, it's going to be dead after a year. Right? So these workshops really only work if people send in submissions. And then you should all feel very much invited, even if you're a member of the SIMUQ community. MIPS is a really cool conference. I'm going to be honest, it's cooler than SIMUQ. <laughs> <laughs> it has, it has 7,000 participants, and it's a really cool place. Uh, in like sort of Valley culture stuff, right? So just let's try that. Um, and I wonder whether there's room to just have both, right? Just to, so SIMUQ happens to be early in the year, which is quite nice. It's sort of it's not at the same time, so it doesn't really overlap, right? Having two meetings a year is a reasonable frequency. It would even give a bit of an option for the more theoretical people to go sort of focus a bit more on SIMUQ and the more applied application-driven people to be a little bit more towards NIPS. Maybe that's what we should be doing, right? Maybe we just split this sort of up into two branches that try to connect as much as possible. Yeah, I actually, oh, is this, okay. Um, yeah, so I agree that we need to have, uh, we need to um, have gatherings that are um, sort of um, geared towards probabilistic numerics in different areas. And uh, I have attended one of the NIPS workshops and it has been excellent. So I have to, I have to uh, definitely agree with that. In terms of uh, submitting to NIPS though, um, I, I actually just sort of want to make you aware that there's a difference in, in sort of the publication culture between different um, areas. So in, um, for example, in statistics, we uh, publish a lot less in conference proceedings. And that's not, I mean, that's, that's just kind of the way the culture is. Um, so I wonder if um, only having, um, organizing something like NIPS um, would sort of exclude some, some people. Um, but I think it is important to have, and I think SIMUQ is important to have. So we have now covered uh, machine learning with NIPS. We have now covered sort of applied mathematics with SIMUQ. I think we need to have more of a presence in statistics, statistical community. So something like maybe a spatial statistics conference, or um, I feel like what's, we have a lot in common with spatial statistics. We use very many of the similar tools. Um, so that might be that might be something to think about. Just very briefly to avoid a misunderstanding, so for, I, I know that this is a common misconception about the differences between CS and other areas. Mm -hmm. That um, so, a, a workshop at NIPS has workshop submissions, which are quite similar to the kind of submissions you would send to a mini symposium uh, or even a conference in applied mathematics. Right. Mm -hmm. So everyone's very much invited to send those in, and you should not worry about. Uh, coming up against that sort of a real competition in, for a workshop at NIPS. If you send your paper to NIPS proper, you should expect very serious reviews. Yeah. So NIPS, a paper at NIPS, at the actual conference in machine learning is comparable to, I would venture to say, a nature publication in biology, right? It's a really challenging, but, <laughs> but, well, no, no, I think it actually, acceptance rates are below 20%. That's what I mean by that, right? And it is very competitive. Nature has about 12% acceptance rate, I think, of submissions, and about 20% in biology. So it's sort of fair comparison. Uh, yeah, so, so uh, just, just so that there's no misunderstanding, when I say we should organize a workshop at NIPS, that should be a venue where everyone can send something. Those of us who feel, as core members of the machine learning community, will keep sending out papers to the conference proper, which is more like a journal. OK, I think Human has uh, something to say. I actually have a f question for Philip. So when you submit a paper to NIPS, you have these different categories, right? Algorithms has acceptance rate of 5% or something. Where do you send your papers when you send them to NIPS? Uh, the areas do not matter at all. <laughs> is, is that really okay, true? Okay, so they have an absolutely minimal effect because they affect how potential reviewers are shown your papers. So when, pa when, when reviewers bid on papers, there's various different views in the GUI that show you the papers. And one of them is along which keywords people put. But they are also sorted by an automated algorithm according to how well they fit to you. And it's a different way to look at them in the GUI. So yes, it has a tiny little effect. But it's not like in a journal where you basically select the action editor, and then that has a huge effect on the outcome. right? Okay. So I would probably put optimization or probation methods or something. Gaussian what processes. Oh, Gaussian processes. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a trivial question, because actually, the kind of reviewers you get from one of these papers has a huge influence on whether or not it gets in. And 
I, I think the kind of group of reviewers we've, we've found within the machine learning community that is most sympathetic to what we're trying to do is that associated with Gaussian processes. So if you use those kind of keywords in your title and abstract, you'll hopefully be better off. <laughs> Actually, the one thing that matters a lot more at NIPS is the, the topic model that, that grades your paper against the reviewers. So if you use words like Bayesian, probabilistic, um, Gaussian processes, regression, then you might end up with the right people, right? So <laughs> if, you use, if you use words like, like convergence rate and optimization, you'll end up with the OR community or the optimization people in machine learning, which, who are maybe a little bit more selective uh, from the theoretical perspective, but I mean, for you, that's not a problem. <laughs> okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to make one passing remark, a bit of advertising that uh, a mayor went around yesterday advertising that um, there's a new journal, the SIAM Journal for Mathematics of Data Science, whose doors are now basically open or are open within a few days to start taking submissions, and that's another venue that this uh, community could consider. Um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move us on to uh, our final uh, discussion. Um, formulating a, a revised or renewed, reinvigorated manifesto, um, Tubingen Manifesto version two, the, the Euston Road Manifesto. Um, you know, typical uh, kinds of questions here. What are our strengths and weaknesses as a community and as a set of tools? What are the low-hanging fruits and killer apps? Something we've already discover, uh, discussed, but worth reiterating. Slightly more provocative, what are the dangers? Um, where are the pitfalls that we should be uh, thinking about? Um, what is the, the version 2018 view of PN and uh, already alluded to by the panelists, what has changed since the Tübingen Manifesto? Um, well, to me, the obvious danger is one that we've kind of discussed already, which is that there aren't very many of us. There are a huge range of problems that we're trying to tackle. And, you know, we're not going to get meaningful progress towards those goals unless we bring on a lot of new people, perhaps by kind of joining up to some other communities. I mentioned Bayesian organisation in my own talk. Or by kind of sacrificing some of the things we might ideally want to do uh, in favour of sort of competing with each other in a more limited set of questions. I, I think we need that. I mean, if we're all over the place, it's, the field is not going to get traction. Um, I think that um, as you know, this is a pretty young community, um, we need to talk about, as, as you just mentioned, how we can incorporate um, people from outside of our group, of, of our uh, community to contribute. Um, and I wonder if, and, and this is a question that I have, I guess, I wonder if um, sometimes uh, by very like, so, so I think there are two things that we could do is just very broadly define what probabilistic numerics means and then say, oh, if you're doing this, you're then in our area. Or the other option would be to very loosely define what it is we do and then just, you know, have a lot of people contributing. I think there are like pros and cons to both of those, um, the, both of those opportunities. Um, and I'm just, I'm just wondering if any of you have any, any thoughts about it. And I'm specifically going to direct in Yusuf's direction with a particular slant. I don't know if you are, I know you already had some thoughts, but I don't know if you were going to answer it in this frame. You're very active in the SIAM activity group on UQ, I believe the secretary of the group. Um, and in the time that I've been attending that conference, the first conference was, I believe, 2012, um, where we had something of the order of two or 300 participants, and it was considered a roaring success. And it seems to, every two years, have undergone some kind of geometric growth rate. Um, so from your insider's seat in that community, and in particular in that activity group, how has that been achieved? So that's some food for thought in your answer. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. Um, hmm. Well, I think I think Siam UQ has been able to draw from maybe three somewhat overlapping groups: um, applied math, certainly, um, statistics, uh, to a lesser extent, but I think still in a substantial way. And, and I think that's grown over the years, and that's been very positive and important. Uh, and also engineering and people with engineering, geophysics, ecology, people with applications where they sort of clearly need UQ or want UQ or want to understand how UQ can help them solve problems. And I think looking at the mini symposia in SIAM UQ, you see that whole range. And I should mention things like data simulation, um, you know, sort of atmospheric and oceanic data simulation also is kind of geophysics slash applied math. Um, and I think all those communities have kind of found questions maybe that they've already had 
resonating with what's discussed at the conference, and then they feel like okay, here is a central place where I can go. Um, I think that that's at least part um, part of it. And, uh, and also, there's been the Siam UQ Journal, which started around the same time, or maybe I think between the first and second conference, I forget exactly when. And I think that's also kind of helped um, sort of centralize um, people's efforts to some extent. Um, yeah. Now, now, I guess there's obvious next question is so how, to, uh, how it, could the PN community draw any lessons from that? Um, that's a harder question. I'll defer that for a second. <laughs> um, but uh, what I was going to say earlier is I feel like as as someone who I'm mean, still consider myself a bit of an outsider to PN, um, I think from the outside perspective, I think what's needed is, um, as Philip said in his opening talk, compelling applications. Um, second, um, a clear statement of the goals of the endeavor. And then third, I think, um, a notion of context. And by context, I mean how it relates to other fields. And, and this is, I think, something that probably, you know, is hard to get initially, but certainly since over the years, I think, and I think all of you have spoken to this, like, you know, insofar as you sort of butt up against numerical analysis or machine learning or this or that, understanding you know, what is what, not in a sort of exclusionary way or not in a prescriptive way, but understanding where does this fit in and what are the questions that are being answered here that are different um, and unanswered in the other fields. And I think as those, as that vision clarifies, I think then people could get drawn to it and more people would join in. Okay, um, as particularly as Philip and Mike answer, I'd particularly like your thoughts on what has changed since the yeah. Tübingen Manifesto. Yeah. So um, maybe also reply to reply to your points. Um, the when when we and with we I mean sort of many people in this room started this work. Let's say around 2012 or so when we had the NIPS workshop on probabilistic numerics. Um, we, 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 had, we, had, we, we identi identified very similar kind of questions to those that are up here on a more basic level. And I think back then we often, we, we, we barely, at least those of us who were on the machine learning side, barely understood what was available in applied mathematics. And we, we didn't know, right? We were just different background. And um, I remember around, shortly after that time, I also had to, uh, I, I pitched a, a, a large uh, research grant to a, to a panel that asked very similar questions. And I, back then, I, I think my, my pitch was, this is a bit of a crazy idea, and let's just try it, and let's please give us time, give us like five years to sort out the basic fundamental questions, and let's just, I would like to draw a, a credit line, right? And just try for five years to sort out all these questions, and then after that, you can ask me again about applications, and we'll start sorting out the applications. And they agreed. Lots of old people in a, in a room, panel around like that, and they said, okay, let's try that. So now, that was uh, in 2014, right? The five years are not over yet. They're beginning to, they're coming close. And this meeting here, this week, has convinced me that we've actually come a very long way along this sort of plan. So by now, we have a very broad understanding of the connections to the classic methods. Um, it might not always be evident in the talks, so maybe I should here do this uh, very nasty thing and pitch our book that's going to come out at the, at the at beginning of next year, probably, um, uh, which Mark Jolomi and Mike and I are, are writing, which tries to sort of set this kind of scene and try to make this connection. And having written the corresponding chapters, I, I actually think that we now have a relatively clear understanding of the connections of what we want to do as well, thanks to uh, work like all of yours, right? Um, and the constraints and what now needs to happen, so the next S-curve, as uh, the, the managers would say, is that we now really have to go on with to, to the applications and really make a difference. And it was okay to take this time and understand it. We're still doing it to some extent. We're not totally done yet. In particular, linear algebra, I think there's still some really weird open questions. Um, while differential equations, for example, are much further on and are much better understood. Uh, and now there's a real opportunity to move on. So I would like to avoid this sort of impression that we're sort of tried around a little bit and it didn't really work. So it's, it's quite, the, quite the opposite. We've really solved some hard questions. This was really hard work for everyone in this room who've worked in this, who's worked in this area. And now it's time to keep moving, but towards real applications and really making a difference. And I'm super excited about it. I think this, the, the, the really cool time is, is only, only about to come now because now we have the foundation 
those of us who've invested all this time, we now know how these things work, and it's gonna be a lot easier to make uh, progress towards real applications because it's just, you know, it's just actually doing and using all the things that we've understood up to this point. So it's, it's only gonna become more fruitful rather than harder doing applications. Okay, with, with regret, I'm going to put you on pause just for a moment, Mike, to give uh, Fred an opportunity to interject from the audience. Fred Hickernell. Um, I consider myself sympathetic to PN. I'm not sure if I'm a part yet, but um, I've been a part of the Monte Carlo, quasi Monte Carlo community, the white water bottle that a couple of us have. Um, about 20 years ago, the IBC community, which was mentioned by Homan, invaded the MCQMC community. And if you go to an MCQMC conference, you may hear a talk by the IBC people that seems to have nothing to do with Quasi Monte Carlo, but it's been embraced. Now, was it two years ago when the PN community came to MCQMC? I'd like to encourage more interaction between PN and IBC, which has already been mentioned, PN and Monte Carlo, Quasi Monte Carlo. I think you will get pushed back in some sense because sometimes people will look and say, wait, aren't you just reframing something? But I think you have something to say, and even in these talks we've heard discussions about how you, we do not want to just be reinventing a new idea with a, a different name. But I, besides the NIPS and the SIAM UQ, I would encourage interaction with those communities, because I think there's a lot of people who are sympathetic and we have a lot to learn from you. Uh, I'll just add a bit about the NIPS. You, you mentioned NIPS, that sounds exciting to me. It also sounds very scary because I hear about 5% acceptance rates. So I didn't raise my hand when you said, will you come to NIPS? I might if someone tells me what to do and, or, if it's, or if what I'm doing has any uh, appropriate use in NIPS. So uh, a suggestion. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Fred. Um, Mike, I'm aware I put you on pause, so please, you have the floor. Um, well, speaking at least for myself, I'd be very happy to kind of give advice or guidance as to how to work towards a NIPS paper. I'm not saying that it's necessarily going to be useful, but uh, anyway, I, I wanted to kind of hark back to what I said before about one of the dangers to this community, it's diversity, but in a way that's the real strength, right? Because actually I think what probabilistic numerics has that traditional numerics doesn't have is its ability to tackle a much wider range of problems that we're flexible, enabling the solution of these exotic problems, particularly those found in machine learning. So maybe the way we should think of ourselves is kind of like a a factory for the churning out of um, different communities. Maybe we don't actually have to be all that unified at all times. Maybe we can you know, maintain probabilistic numerics as an umbrella within which we can you know, sequentially churn out Bayesian optimization as a previously successful example and then probabilistic integration in my dreams as another example. Maybe that's okay. Any comments? I would like to support this idea of um, reaching out to other communities. There are several communities that are emerging now at the interface between numerical analysis and inference. Next week, there is a workshop at Banff called uh, Data Science Meets Numerical Analysis. And they could, have, they could have called it PN, but they called it something different, right? <laughs> and. Uh, and now there are people using, trying to use neural nets to solve PDs in high dimensional spaces. Well, uh, I, w I would love to see some kind of meta community emerging, some kind of conference bringing all these people together because I think those interactions, I mean, I learn a lot from, from these different communities when they come together. And I, I think it will be very beneficial. On that point, so, um this is maybe a little bit addressed to, to Yusuf as well. The, um, I think from the pr perspective of, of uh, machine learning, the existence of UQ is sometimes a little bit of a sad development because it means that a lot of the stuff that could have been in our community from the mathematical side was a little bit lost on computer science, right? Um, and maybe also the other way around. So it, I think it sometimes also happens that, I wouldn't really say the wheel is reinvented in UQ, but there's, I've, I've been to Simon UQ at least once so far, and I, I, I sometimes couldn't quite escape the impression that there's a few things there that you could have read in a NIPS paper four years ago. Not always, right, of course. Um, and, and in fact, quite sort of on the, on the other uh, bank of this river, um, NIPS last year had this um, award talk, 10 years test of time award, 
where uh, Ali Rahimi complained that NIPS has sort of sometimes lost a little bit of its philosophy uh, or mathematical rigor, and it would be nice to have more mathematicians. He complained that the math police had left the room. <laughs> right? There used to be these people coming around that would poke you at your poster and make sure that you really are the rigor, the rigor police, the rigor police, yeah, ensuring that you proof actually or that you have to have a proof. Um, and that's sort of it's coming back now, right? So the pendulum is beginning to swing back. So that maybe is more of an invitation to the applied mathematicians to come back to NIPS. I, I totally see your point that if your first contact with, with the NIPS community is the reviews that you get back when you send in a paper to the main conference, it can be a bit of a weird experience. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we uh, tend to have sort of support groups in my, in my group when the, when the reviews come out of, after <laughs> NIPS. Uh, that's a, that's a bit of a problem with, with the way that the conference works. And maybe a way into this is if we organize a NIPS workshop, and I, I, by the way, I actually I'd like to invite Roman as well along to try to organize this as our uh, other foothold in NIPS. Uh, a workshop could be, can be a really nice way to come in because it's easy to send the paper, right? It's easy, for a PN workshop, we're going to have acceptance rates above 90% for submissions. Mm -hmm. It's usually just a sanity check. And it's a good opportunity to come see the main conference, right? Come around, so NIPS is a three days main conference and then two days of workshops, at least so far, it might change soon. Um, and um, uh, get to know this community, see the posters at the main conference, and then spend time in our own little circle in our workshop, mm -hmm. you know, and talk about the more minute details that, that are hard to convey to the larger community. And we will have people from the outside conference come into the workshop, see what we're doing, get a feeling for what's going on. Maybe more people will come and join the workshop. Some of us get to see the main conference, right? So I really, the longer I think about it, the more I think we have to organize this workshop. <laughs> okay, so I'm very conscious of the time. Uh, we have been talking for just over an hour. So I'd basically just like to give each panelist the opportunity to say really just a two, three sentences of, of closing thoughts. We'll just maybe start at Yusuf's end and, and, and come back towards... Oh, uh, okay, we'll start at my end and, and work <laughs> towards Yusuf, sorry. Um, so yes, just some closing thoughts. Well, uh, thanks to your team and to Chris for organizing this workshop. It was really an enjoyable event. Thanks a lot. I'd like to second that. I definitely had a wonderful time at this workshop and learned a lot, and I appreciate a lot of the night nice effort that is going on in formalizing a lot of the uh, probabilistic numerical methods and I think that we should be thinking about all those things um, as well. So. Um, likewise, thanks to the organizers, but even more so thanks to everyone in the room for continuing to do fantastic probabilistic numeric work. I feel I may have come across as a little too critical of the breadth of the field. I apologize for that. I absolutely welcome all the contributions and you know, clearly we're in a really exciting direction. Yeah, he took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, <laughs> as, as, as someone who is about to switch to an administrative role, as Oksana told me uh, earlier this week, <laughs> um, I, uh, I would particularly like to thank all, the, all, all of you who are not sitting in the front of the room for continuing to come to these meetings. And those of you who are doing your PhDs in this area, I, I'm really grateful that you've invested sometimes three or four years of your life so far into this a uh, crazy experiment that we've been running for the past four years. Um, I'm convinced that it's a, that's a good investment, and I think those of us in the front of the room will try to make sure it is a good investment for all of you. Uh, and I'm really, I'm really excited that we have this community of people together in the room. Yeah, so I'd mean, like to echo everyone in, in, in thanking Tim and Chris for putting together a really great meeting. And um, I mean, I come away from these three days and thinking, you know, there's there's a very rich variety of things to explore and there's connections between things where I didn't previously see connections and I think that's really one of the strengths of what's going on here and it's sort of a lot to chew on and a lot to explore and I think a, a, a lot to, to broaden the perspective of anyone coming from any particular perspective into this community. I think that this, this effort, one of its real strengths can be to broaden your perspective and give you broader insight into things and I think um, beyond that, I think it's, uh, it's a very exciting effort and love to see how how we all evolve it. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm feeling very much inspired by the uh, some of the discussion here, and um, one of my favorite places uh, in the world as a mathematician is uh, the Mathematical Institute at Oberwolfach in, in southern Germany, where 
you know, people, um, you know, basically go into an almost monastic-like retreat for a, for, for a week because there's nothing else to do in the, in the middle of the Black Forest but do math. Um, but one very nice tradition that they have there is, um, you know, everyone, if you give a talk, you, you write essentially an extended abstract of a couple of pages and these get collected together in a, in a, in a citable proceedings volume. And I would just like a quick show of hands who would be willing to write a, a really just a couple of pages extended abstract of their of their talk and send it to us and we put together a document uh, that documents um, our discussions of this week quick show great okay this is this is something we we will organize um, as as a follow up um, as one of the co organizers i'll um i'll say thank you to to the panelists to everyone who's um made the workshop what, what it is. I mean, you, you can't just be at the front and have no one to, to talk to. And I think the um, collaborative discussions have shown how, how vibrant this, this community is. Um, Chris and I have received a huge amount of administrative support from the Turing Institute um, in terms of the logistics of getting this workshop running. And of course, the financial support from SAMSI and from the Lloyd's Register Foundation that have made the travel possible, especially for uh, the uh, participants from the U.S., whose uh, you know travel budget is necessarily uh, much larger than those coming from from Germany. Um, I think, Chris, uh, you really should have the final word in terms of closing the workshop and this discussion. Oh well, I mean, I, I think everyone has um, uh, made some really excellent points, and there's not. Uh, a single thing I could add that would improve on what was said already. Um, I'd just like to thank um, the panelists for their uh, really interesting perspectives. Um, I'd like to thank all the attendees for the workshop, including those that unfortunately had to had to go a bit earlier. Um, it's been a really productive three days, and I found that personally I've um, I've, I've learned a lot. Um, even though I've been running around organising this, I've still picked up an awful lot of knowledge that I'm very grateful for. Um, so uh, on that, I'd just like to close the session and, and thank you again. <laughs>